morning um, that are uh, schedule and otherwise related. Um, next Sunday after worship, we need to have another experiment of year 2020. We need to have a brief congregational meeting to elect a nominating committee next week. So session has selected their member. The deacons will need to select a member. I have to remind all of you that you don't nominate somebody who hasn't given you permission to nominate them. <laughs> um, we will need, um, we've got our elder, we'll need a deacon, and we'll need three at large from the congregation. This will be the group that will look for our elders and deacons for the next um, cycle of that. Um, so if you are able and willing or know somebody who would be good at it, please ask them and come prepared with their name. Hopefully we can do this relatively quickly post-worship next um, Sunday. This is a learning curve. This is our first congregational meeting on Zoom, so I have no idea how this is going to work. Um, item number two um, is calendar-based as well. Tomorrow is the first day back in school for Marion Schools. Um, a lot of prayer <laughs> would be more than appropriate. Um, one of the things that we noticed when we came on campus this morning is that the blessing box is completely empty. Um, as school starts up, that's probably going to be more of a need cycle we're going to see. There will be students on campus. There will be students distanced. Um, that at least is the plan to start things. So um, as you do your grocery shopping, if you can pick up um, something that's shelf stable, something that's not going to go bad in the heat or the cold or something like that, um, and just run it by and put it in the box, that's great. Um, we'll be moving some of our donations from the Ministerial Alliance out there, and JR has been able to give me some snacks that he can't distribute there. So we'll stock it that way as well. But just when you come by, please notice those sorts of things and be thinking about our community um, as you do. Um, let's see, those two things. Also, things are changing on the church property. I know most of you aren't here that often right now, but uh, we have some new flooring in the kitchen and the entryway. Um, and the bathrooms in the fellowship hall, this is designed to be hospital grade uh, vinyl plank, so it should be non-slip even when wet, and those sorts of things be easier to clean. Um, I know none of you ever spill food or drinks in the fellowship hall, so that's not an issue, but the carpet would beg to differ um, based on its interesting pattern of things, so we're hoping that uh, this will be easier to clean and maintain over the long haul. Um, also, if you drive by the church after dark, um, on the front edge of the portico is the cross that used to hang in the sanctuary at Ridgeway. Tom Kacharik refurbished that, made it safe to be outdoors, put lights behind it, and he and Ron Campbell hung it and put it on a timer this last week. So that is out there. It's just another way to make us visible in the community, but take a look at that. It looks pretty good. We saw it on our dog walk this week, and uh, that's just another way to show that we're here in the community. Um, there's some other things about the week ahead that we'll get to during the minute for mission. Mads, is anybody jumping up and down about announcements or anything that's been missed? No, nobody is jumping up and down. So Bill Momsen is our liturgist today, and uh, Mary is our musician today, along with, I believe, Granger for some pieces. Um, so we have, or we are making all of them co-hosts, and I think we're ready to worship God. So let's start with our introit.
There we go. Had to get myself unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Today's call to worship is uh, from Psalm 105. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon God's name. Make God's deeds known to all people. Sing to God. Sing praises to the Lord. Dwell on all God's wondrous works. Give praise to God's holy name. Let the hearts rejoice of all those seeking God, Lord. Pursue the Lord and God's strength. Seek the face of God always. Remember the wondrous works God has done. All the marvelous works and the justice God declared. You are the offspring of Abraham, God's servant. And the children of Jacob, God's chosen ones. Amen. Today's call to confession. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In unison now, we pray for your coming, O God. We pray for the presence of Christ in our world and in our lives. We are also the people who do not want to hear your message and the people who are willing to run you out of town. We are the people who want to preserve our own power. And we will go to great lengths to achieve that end. Come to us once more. Open our hearts and minds, our eyes and ears. That we may hear you. Full of grace, steadfast in love, abounding in mercy and then we may follow you showing your love grace and mercy to one another and the world anyone who is in christ is in a new creation the old life is gone a new life has begun Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. I'm going to take a moment and share with you um, as a minute for mission about the Presbyterian Week of Action that is this next week. The General Assembly um, 
staff, the folks who do the work of the General Assembly in between when the General Assembly um, works, has put together a week um, to talk about justice, social action, and the ways in which the church can be a visible um, leader in the world. So this week they are hosting a week of action. Um, in the 20 some odd years I've been in ministry, this is the only time I've ever seen the denomination do something like this. Um, 2020 is weird on a bunch of levels. Um, so part of this is that we have many of us the ability to engage in a different way. But part of it also is that we have a need to engage in a different way. Um, I'm going to send all of you some of this text um, via email later, and you can refer to it as you want to. I just want to bring out um, two pieces um, from this. Um, Psalm, uh, Proverbs 21.3, which starts this off, is a quote that says, To do righteousness... And justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Um, so I'm going to give you guys kind of the, the schedule of things for the week. Um, some of these things will be live events. Most of them will be streaming live events because that's where we are right now. Um, and others will be resources for you to invade, um, engage at your convenience. All the live events will be recorded so you can view them later. Um, Monday is a global day of solidarity to hear about and witness the support of our siblings from around the world to witness their experiences of racism in their own context. Tuesday is a town hall meeting uh, from 12.30 to 2 p.m. Central Time. Engage with theologians, community activists, pastors, and practitioners in the way, in the intersectional work of anti-racism and how the denomination, our denomination, um, has grappled with this in our history, um, in the past, in the present, and looks to grapple with it in the future. Um, Wednesday, starting at 11, uh, there's a Bible study um, and conversation around things. Um, so there'll be videos and live stream conversations um, different topics of different things. One will be about engaging the lectionary and one will be an intercultural conversation. Um, Thursday um, is remarking that all year long Presbyterian women have joined the World Council of Churches um, for Thursdays in black to protest gender-based violence. Um, and then a webinar about farm workers in the pandemic and the struggle that farm workers have and are having. And then in the evening, um, which is something I think many of you may be interested in, is a COVID-19 memorial service um, to pause and remember those who, who have died during the pandemic. As a pastor, that's been one of the toughest areas to engage around because we haven't been able to do all the things we normally do. There have been no casserole dishes. Um, we haven't been able to hug people. We haven't been able to just take a hand and do some of those things. Um, this congregation still has not been able to gather as the people of God to celebrate the life and resurrection of Margaret High this spring. Um, and so that evening um, from 4 to 5 p.m., there will be a uh, service to allow us to do that. Friday... Um, is a day um, uh, marking Give 828, a day of giving focused on supporting um, black benefiting organizations. Um, that's a national event that we are piggybacking on. At noon, there's a young adult round table for a conversation about how young adults are, are grappling with these things. And at two, two o'clock, um, there's a video about um, it's called Trouble the Water. It's a documentary that's been put together um, by the denomination. Um, Saturday, they're keeping us busy all week, um, 
is to uh, do some connectional events in the afternoon. Sunday, they're calling for a day of service for congregations and presbyteries and synods to engage in service to their communities following worship. So um, this will be on the church Facebook page, on the website, and in your email to give you a chance to plug in. Um, as school starts here, a lot of people are having new new schedules and things like that. Um, but I would encourage you to find a way to plug in and figure out um, what you might want to be working on this week for the church, for the community, and for our nation. Um, that is going to get us to our first lesson, um, which is from the second chapter of Matthew's Gospel. We have started um, today our second three-week mini-series on the people of God in a strange land. And so this is the first passage for that day. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus. 
brings us to our second passage, which is a little bit further along in the life of Jesus. Um, It's in Mark's gospel, the sixth chapter. Jesus has started his public ministry. He, that being Jesus, left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in a synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their disbelief. Then he went out among among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. For this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said it is Elijah. And others said it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, in case the sermon title looks a little opaque to you, Um, there is a phrase in community planning called NIMBY. And it stands for not in my backyard. And you'll often hear when a community is planning something, oh, we need a new landfill. Well, not over here. Oh, we need a new school. Well, certainly not here. We need a group home. Well, not here. We need a new power plant. Well, not here. We need a new park not here. We need to expand a road. Well, not here. We need a parking lot. Not here. We all want these things in our community, but certainly not too close to us. Certainly not where they would inconvenience us. And so the phrase, the acronym that comes out is NIMBY. Not in my backyard. Often said with more vehemence, not in my backyard. Um, imagine it being said in the tone of the angry old man who yells at the kids to get off his lawn and you've probably got it quite right that is what I thought of as I read these two scripture passages today 
about the coming of the Messiah. In Matthew's gospel, this is chapter 2. This is immediately in the text right after the wise men have come and seen Jesus and left by another way. Um, And typically this is the Sunday after Christmas and it's labeled as the slaughter of the innocents in your liturgical calendars. And because it's the Sunday after Christmas, most of us don't hear it that often. We don't preach on it that often. And frankly, we don't think about it that often. We know that at the end of his life, Jesus will have on the cross above him a sign that will say, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and those will be the charges that ultimately get him killed. They're not really what he's guilty of, but those are the charges. And we see that happening at the beginning of his life as well. The Magi have come. They have somewhat naively for people labeled as wise men, gone up to the king's palace and said, hey, where's the new king? That just seems to kind of like be borrowing trouble to me. Um, And Herod really doesn't like the idea that there is a new king. He is king. There is no new king. He is the king. And Herod goes to quite some lengths to try to solve the problem of this new king. He sends out people looking for children born at the right time for baby boys. He tries to find the one. Initially, he starts off looking for just that one child born king of the Jews, savior of the world, king of kings and lord of lords and he can't find him i mean i sincerely doubt that herod has left the palace to go looking so when i say herod can't find him i mean none of herod's people can find him so herod just gives up and goes home right well herod has this problem herod has power And Herod has power, and Herod doesn't want to lose power. So Herod uses his power in pieces that hearken back to the birth of Moses, because that is what Matthew is doing, is connecting Jesus and Moses. Herod says, let's just get rid of all the baby boys, all of those Hebrew baby boys. We'll just solve the problem. If none of them grow up to be adults, none of them will be a threat. And in a dream, in the same way that the Magi were warned to go home by another way, in a dream, the same way that Joseph rises to power in Egypt, this Joseph is told, go to Egypt. Get out of here. Take your family and run. He does. They hang out in Egypt. We're not really sure entirely how long. The folks who calculate these things aren't really sure when Herod dies. But when Herod dies, an angel of the Lord shows up and says, it's okay, you can come back home now. And Joseph, and this is the most active we ever see Joseph, the father of Jesus in scripture, picks up, takes his family, gets them back, pauses when he hears that Herod's son is on the throne and they end up in Nazareth. Now, you guys have read the rest of the story and you know that all throughout Jesus' ministry, the people who are in power are threatened by him. So Herod starts off the game and then that continues. The religious authorities, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders... The Pharisees and the Sadducees are all angry at, frustrated with, afraid of who Jesus is and where he comes from. And they work really hard because he threatens them. Um, Because if he's 
all that, that means they're not. If we actually jump ahead just briefly into that chapter in Mark, um, one of the things that is always remarkable to me in this passage is that it says, he teaches with wisdom. The Luke version of this is that he teaches with wisdom. Unlike the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he knows what's going on. What's going on with him? And so, Jesus is a threat to power, and power does whatever it can to remove him. Now, you and I, we're Easter people. We know how the end of this story works out. But if you didn't know about resurrection, if you didn't know about Easter, if you didn't know about Good Friday to Easter Sunday morning, you would think that killing somebody is a pretty good way to remove them from the equation. Herod tries it. The chief priests try it. Caiaphas tries it. Judas tries it. The scribes try it. The crowd tries it. And it doesn't work doesn't work. Power doesn't want a Messiah in town. Neither secular power nor religious power wants a Messiah in town. And we may say that's just about the people at the top of the food chain. But the sixth chapter of Mark and its corresponding version in Luke tells us it's not really just about the people at the top of the food chain. By the time we get to Matthew and Mark, they have been waiting hundreds of years for a Messiah. Hundreds of years. They should be really happy to see one, right? I mean, if we stand there and wait at the house for Grandma to get here, and we've only been waiting a day, we're still really excited. If we've been waiting hundreds of years, you would think that we would be excited and receptive, and welcoming. Are we? So Jesus goes home. You know what they say, you can never go home again. And he goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath to do some teaching. Now Mark's version is a little politer, a little less in your face than Luke's version. In Luke's version, he reads from the book of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah, and he goes, kind of mic drops and goes, in your presence, this has been fulfilled. The crowd does not take well to that. The crowd doesn't take well to the polite version in Mark. They say, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? We know him. That's the carpenter's kid. That's the carpenter himself. We know his brothers and his sisters, and they're sitting right here. We know who his parents are. He can't be the Messiah. And the people of Nazareth don't really want a Messiah. Well, they'd really like a Messiah in Jerusalem, or Bethlehem, or Bethsaida, or in Dan, but not in Nazareth. God, it's going to mess everything up. I've always found it interesting how Mark describes what Jesus is able to do in, in Nazareth. Um, After the people take offense to him, Jesus comes back at them. Again, not a way to win friends and influence people, but uh, prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and with their family and in their own house. He could do no power, deed of power there, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. What's it going to take, people of Nazareth? He laid his hands on a few sick people and he cured them. What's it going to... 
somebody walks in to Heartland Hospital and lays their hands on a couple of sick people, what are we going to do? Well, you know as well as I do, we're going to call them a fraud. We're going to say they weren't really sick. We're going to say they weren't really healed. We're going to say that he used medicine or she used medicine or something else. You see, we're not too different. We'd like a Messiah over there. Someplace comfortably where it's not going to mess up our lives too terribly much. I thought about stopping the reading right after, and he was amazed at their unbelief. But I was struck at what Jesus does next. He goes out among the villages teaching, and he sends out the disciples two by two. And we know that two by two imagery pretty well. Um, But he also gives them directions on how to handle things if they're not welcomed. Now, why do you think Jesus would do that right after being made to feel not welcome in his own hometown. Hmm, I wonder. They're just supposed to dust, knock the dust off their shoes. Have you ever knocked the dust, the dirt, the assorted stuff off your shoes? It's not really a gentle activity. It's not like you stand there and go, you know, you kind of take them off and you smack them together and the dust flies up in a cloud and big clumps fall off of it. It's pretty visible. We've made knocking the dust off our sandals kind of like, no, bang, bang, bang. Everybody sees it for two blocks. They were not welcome here. I wonder if Jesus and the disciples showed up today how big the cloud of dust would be in our homes and in our churches. Because this is who we are. We'd like things to be better. Well, as long as they don't inconvenience us too much. Right? We'd like to see the witness of God in the world, as long as we don't have to change too much. We'd like, we'd really like those people over there to get their stuff fixed. Always forgetting that from over there, we're those people over here. And so here we are. And the reality of the message and the incarnation of Jesus Christ is not peaceful. The birth of Jesus Christ leads to death of thousands of children who did nothing more than be born at the wrong time. Because power is so afraid of what the Messiah is and will do and can take away. And when the Messiah comes back, comes home, he's not welcome there either. He can't be powerful. He can't be wise. He can't really be all these things because we know his family. Has anything good ever come out of Bethlehem? We know where you're from. I mean, how good can you be if you're related to Kay Holderfield? I mean, the whole town's related to Kay Holderfield somehow, right? How good can you be? That, that is what is playing out right here, that we know who you are and where you're from, and you can't actually be the Messiah, and if you are, we don't want you to be, because you're right here, and you're right now, and you're immediate, and you're incarnational.
and you're real. It is very easy for us, even in this day, of rapid communication to write off things that happen somewhere else as just something that happened there. That's not real. It's not true. It wouldn't work that way here. And so when the Messiah comes to town, literally comes to town and moves in next door, we're not sure we want that either. This is the perpetual challenge of the people of God. For Christians who claim a theology in which Jesus Christ is fully human and fully divine, fully human means he has a mailing address. In this day and age, it would mean he has a Facebook profile, a Twitter handle, and he does text messaging. For Jesus Christ to be incarnational is really inconvenient for us. And at the same time, it is the entire power of the story that we claim. If Jesus is not human, not flesh and blood, not real, how does he hold his hand out to Jairus' daughter and say, little girl, get up? How does he reach down into the dirt and spit and make mud and put it on a man's eyes and let him see? How does he help the lame to walk, the blind to see, the lepers to be made clean, the woman to stop bleeding? If he's not real, if he's not human, if he's not present with us, if he's not flesh and blood, how does he break the bread and pour the cup? How does he bear the abuse of arrest and interrogation and crucifixion? And if he's flesh and blood, then he could just be down the street. The challenge for us today is really simple. Are we still willing to believe that God became human and moved into the neighborhood? Or when it happens, do we sell the house because the property values are going down and move somewhere else? Do we want a Messiah in our backyard, in our neighborhood, in our city, our state, our town, our nation, and our world? Or would we rather the Messiah, stay somewhere out of sight and out of mind. To God alone be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen. Friends, our affirmation of faith today comes from the study catechism. This is uh, two questions, questions 38 and 39. Your space is the bold type. Why was the title Christ, which means anointed one, applied to Jesus? Jesus Christ was the definitive prophet, priest, and king. All of the Lord's anointed in Israel participated and led finally to him. In assuming these offices, Jesus not only transformed them, but also realized the purpose of Israel's election for the sake of the world. How did Jesus Christ fulfill the office of prophet? He was God's word to a dying and sinful world. He embodied the love he proclaimed. His life, death, and resurrection became the great yes that continues to be spoken despite how often we have said no. When we receive this word by faith, Christ himself enters our hearts that he may dwell in us forever and we in him.
Friends, let us respond to the good news by giving of our tithes, our talents, and our offerings, and gathering our prayers together before God as we hear our offertory. Thank you. Um, As we gather our gifts together um, before God, we do have a couple prayer requests that have come in this past week. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we are your people. We are troublesome and cantankerous at times, and other times we really get it. We get who you are and how you are in the world. We often think that the people who were alive when Jesus came were really dense, but uh, when we're honest, we wonder how much we would have recognized you. We come to you because you came to us, because you have never abandoned us, because you have been with us through the wilderness, because you have touched us with your hands, you have broken bread with us, you have made us welcome. You have entered our homes and we have entered yours. You have stopped what you were doing to be with us. We come to you this day, O God, and we have many things on our minds. The power of your creation is on our minds. From storms that have ripped through Iowa, destroying crops and homes, leaving many without power and communication, are on our minds. Those who are in the path of fire in California and those who have already lost so much from those fires are on our hearts and minds. Those who are in the paths of hurricanes are on our hearts and minds. And those who struggle and battle with disease have been our ever-present companion, both on the headlines of the news and in our lives. So God, we pray for those afflicted by COVID, and we pray for those who are getting sick in so many other ways these days, for those with new diagnoses of cancer, for those who struggle with tuberculosis, for those who still struggle to get clean water, fight off waterborne illness. We struggle and pray for in a world that is not as just as it could be. We pray for Granger's evaluation for his wheelchair to go well and for that to move forward. We pray for the marches on Washington. We pray for the process of our democracy to go well. Not just today, not just through this election season, but over the long haul. God, you know us. You know us better than we know ourselves. You know that we are often self-defeating. We ask you to help us find our best selves, to find the glimmer of you that shines through in each and every one of us. And to help fan that glimmer into a light that shines in the darkness that the darkness cannot overcome. We ask this in the name and the words of the one who came among us and taught us to pray. 
our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.